Well, good morning and welcome to the online worship service for New Song Church in San Dimas, California. My name is Peter Tridey. I'm the chairman of the Elder Board here at New Song. And I just want you to know that we are so excited that you have invited us into your home uh, to participate in this time of worship. I want to take a little moment to share a little bit with you about what you'll expect to see over the next hour or so. First, I'm going to take a few minutes to just tell you a little bit about New Song and uh, how we can connect with each other. And then our lead pastor, Grant Miles Era, will be presenting a message uh, in our teaching series, All Right Here. You know, at New Song, we have a mission statement. Our mission here at New Song is that we wish to be transformed by the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus, love people, and do good. And, you know, of course, in this pandemic situation, we have to rethink how we do that. And I just want you to know that the elders here at New Song have been spending a lot of time talking about that and trying to really grasp not only how we can kind of get back to some normalcy, but also how we can look at this as an opportunity for change and uh, how God might be leading us to think about our community in even new and different ways. So we're working through that process. We're paying ten attention to the state guidelines and uh, making sure that we're doing things in a, in a wise way. Um, but we do uh, look forward to that time when you know, we can have some community times together again soon. Uh, you know, also during this time, we are right in the middle of our, the start of our budget cycle. So uh, the elders are also looking at our annual goals and uh, our budget for the coming year. And of course, that means that we need to meet with our members to, uh, to go over that information and vote on it. So you will be hearing from us uh, relatively soon about how we're going to do that, obviously, this year. It might be a little bit different than it, it has been in the past. Um, I would encourage you to pay attention to our Facebook page. Um, even if you're not on Facebook, you can still go to the New Song Facebook page and find information there. There will be news available, particularly about things like uh, what the elders are talking about right now and uh, other things that are going on around New Song. So check us out on Facebook. Please uh, take that opportunity to, to see what's going on there. Another way that you can connect with us is through our digital connect card, and that's on our website. This is just a way for us to get to know you better. And of course, right now, you know, a lot of people have needs that they didn't anticipate six months ago. So if, uh, if you have any particular needs or anything that you'd like to share with the leadership here at New Song, um, this is a great way uh, for that to happen. Um, so please go to the digital connect card, fill out that information, and we will make sure to be in touch with you through that. You know, uh, a church like ours uh, operates on gifts that come from people within our community. And if, uh, if you call New Song home, um, you're probably one of those people that has really kept our ministries alive through your financial gifts. And we're so appreciative of that. And uh, we just want to let you know that there are a couple of different ways that you can give. If you go to our website, you'll find some uh, digital methods available there. You can also mail a gift to the church office, and uh, it'll be received that way as well. But any gift that you give, we want you to know that it is our objective to use that uh, to fulfill our mission statement and to reach people for Jesus. And uh, that's really our main goal at, here at New Song. So um, your financial gifts will go towards the, the ministries here at New Song that make that possible. Would you pray with me now as, as you consider in your heart how God might have you participate in the ministries at New Song? Heavenly Father, God, we are grateful for the resources that you have provided us with. God, here at New Song, um, we have just been blessed by um, the gifts of uh, those that, that uh, identify with and associate with New Song's ministries. And God, um, we are just grateful for that. I pray, God, that you would, as we now consider how we might give, God, that you would help us to do that with cheerful hearts, not out of obligation, God, but just with a desire to see your kingdom furthered. And God, I pray for the leadership at New Song that as we make decisions about the use of those resources and those finances, God, that you would uh, just help us to make decisions that are wise and that are pleasing to you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
<laughs> Brilliant. Love it. Please join me as we pray now for ourselves, our community, our nation, and our world. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all life, we come in prayer in response to your invitation, and we come in Jesus' name. We ask that you continue your amazing transformative work in us so that we would demonstrate increasingly the amazing fruit of your spirit and be agents of change in our communities. So we pray today for love, love for you and for others, not just an emotional feeling of attraction or preference, but the kind of love that we have been shown by you, unconditional love that leads to faithful acts of service to others. And we thank you for the loving acts of care and service being performed by so many people during these times. And we rejoice to see evidences of your work in our world. We pray for joy. Lighten our heavy hearts. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, that we've been called by name, forgiven, and our feet have been set upon your paths of righteousness and freedom. We pray that the joy that you bring to us might spread out across this weary world of ours and that we might bring that joy into our spheres of influence. And we pray for peace. May we take the peace that you have so graciously offered us and share it with others. We pray for peacemakers all over the world. We pray for an end to the violence of war and unrestrained greed at the expense of your creation and of precious people made in your image. We pray for peace between us and our neighbors and peace between your followers who differ in their convictions about politics, culture, or any other issue that might cause disunity in your church. You prayed that we might be one and that the world would see you by our love for one another. We pray for all the other churches in our community that you would guide them throughout this season of decision-making with your wisdom and direction. We pray that your church might be seen throughout this season as peacemakers and not troublemakers. We pray for patience. We thank you, God, for your patience with us. You know that we are dust and that we are not as strong as we often like to think we are. Thank you for your patience with us. And Lord, when we find ourselves becoming weary of the perpetual cruelty and callousness of our race and the broken parts of our own lives, give us patience to wait upon you, being ready at each moment to join you in any good work to relieve suffering and to share the good news of your kingdom. And Lord, we are tired of this current situation. Please give us patience and the eyes and ears to see the subtle gifts that you give us during this time of upheaval. And we pray for kindness. Oh God, you are so very kind. Sometimes we might think that you are perhaps too kind when you seem to allow bad things to happen and bad people to prosper. But we recognize that we are also recipients of your kindness and that we do harm as we live our own lives. We too are guilty and in need of your kindness and grace. Lord, make us kind like you are kind, quick to listen, slow to anger, slow to judge, and quick to forgive others. We pray for goodness. Lord, you are so good. May we have eyes to see the good gifts that you give us every day in creation, in our friendships and family, family relationships, and in the small moments of beauty and connection with you and with others. May this goodness nourish us and glorify your name. We pray for faithfulness. May we take seriously the promises and covenants that we have made with others in marriage in business, 
in friendship and those with whom we work every day. O oh God, you are so faithful. May your steadfast, persistent truthfulness and fidelity make us like you. We pray for gentleness. You are awesome in power without end, creator of the universe and the one who could tear it all apart, yet your tenderness is without equal. Teach us to be gentle, to hold back our harsh words and restrain ourselves from violence. We pray for self-control. Help us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you each day to practice our faith in such a way that you become more and more the center of our being, the goal of our living, and the focus for our hoping, praying, and doing. For we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Grant and I'm lead pastor at New Song Church and it is a joy to join you today. And if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook uh, live on the Sunday morning, um, I just say hi. There's a comments box that you can just uh, let us know that you're here. It's wonderful to, to do that. Uh, I'm w watching usually Sunday morning and it's great to see the comments and just the little bit of banter between us uh, on that day. Uh, over the past two weeks, we've had some wonderful messages from Josh and Melody, which I have blessed me immensely. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about having a team of, of uh, preachers and teachers at New Song that we get all these different perspectives, but we really are pressing into the same thing. Uh, the fact that life inevitably will bring us seasons of disorientation. But we firmly believe that in a relationship with God, uh, we can find ourselves newly, newly oriented, uh, especially actually in those places where we find ourselves un unable to perhaps cope with our current situation. We join with God, we seek God, we pray to God, and then we respond as he leads us together. Um, jo uh, Joseph and Esther were the characters of the Old Testament that we looked at. Uh, and it was wonderful to hear from Josh that in every aspect of Joseph's life, every place where he found himself, even in prison, uh, the scripture tells us that God was always with him. And that, that should give us the confidence to believe that God is always with us and no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. And then Melody uh, brought a word about Esther in a time and place, in a circumstance of life that although scary and potentially tragic, uh, was actually uh, the perfect time for her to be alive in that particular place uh, and to live fully into that uh, with courage and had great consequences, not only for herself, but the salvation and rescue of her people. Uh, similarly, uh, you are where you're meant to be today. Uh, and and our, our own lives are rich with the purposes of God uh, that we can press into no matter what our limitations I just want to thank uh, Josh and Melody for bringing those words to us the past couple of weeks. This week, we're going to look at another Old Testament character as we continue in our uh, series of sermons, uh, telling us that, that we are all right here. Uh, we're all right here in this place. Uh, we are okay. Uh, God is with us. And also, another fact is that everything that we need to continue to grow uh, in relationship to God and one another is all right here. It's the stuff of our lives um, the very circumstances we find ourselves in are the material that God uses to shape us and mold us and make us like him. And today we're going to look at an Old Testament uh, character by the name of Elijah. And you may or may not have heard of Elijah. He lived around the middle of the 9th century BC when Israel was actually quite a powerful nation in the world. And he was identified as a prophet. 
Uh, and his name actually means, my God is Yahweh. And that was the name for God that the Israelites knew of from that time. It seems as if even from his name, from his beginning, he was dedicated by his parents uh, to serve the God of Israel from birth. His parents must have had very high hopes for him to give him such a, a, an amazing name. It's like calling your kid future brain surgeon or rocket scientist or something like that. Uh, they clearly had their desires for him to become a servant of the most high God of their people. And what a guy he became. He, he certainly exceeded any predictions that, that his name might have suggested. Much of Elijah's life consisted of a series of miraculous events and victories and overall a very successful and prominent ministry. And miracles were performed through this man, miracles of the provision of food uh, and healing and, and even the bringing back to death, back to life of a dead child. In fact, the very first time that he is mentioned, which is in 1 Kings chapter 17, if you want to check it out, he just kind of appears out of nowhere. There's no word about anything it just suddenly it says, and Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. What an opening. He steps out into the scene and addresses the king of Israel with this proclamation from God through him that the rain was going to stop because it was an issue. God was bringing some judgment on the people because of their uh, walking away from worshiping him into false gods. It's like some kind of divinely appointed weatherman from day one. And even actually chapters later when Elijah leaves the scene, he doesn't have some ordinary death. It says that he is taken up like a chariot of fire and this whirlwind takes Elijah straight up into heaven, miraculously taken. He leaves just as abruptly as he arrived. And actually in the New Testament, he's also a very prominent character. He, he, all through the story of the people of God, he continues to be a name upon their lips. Um, and he's used uh, as an example of good things often. John the Baptist, who came before Jesus to announce that the kingdom of God was coming and to turn towards Jesus, was called by many to be someone in the pattern of Elijah, announcing the kingdom of God and the good news. Jesus himself was actually spoken of at one point as if he was perhaps Elijah returned to earth. And then when Jesus hangs on the cross, the people watching, when Jesus is speaking, they say he's going to call on Elijah to save him, to bring him down from the cross. And then much later on in the book of James, which we studied last year, uh, prayer is illustrated by the use of Elijah, who was a man of faith, who prayed that the rain would stop and it stopped and then prayed again that it would begin again and it did. He's somewhat of a hero in, in this culture. A heroic figure, uh, the, the, the focus and the uh, source for amazing, powerful things. What a guy. And we find parallels of that in our own culture. We're very good about making heroes out of people. And sometimes it des it's deserved and sometimes not so. Actually, right now, I think we can safely say that m many people working in the medical establishment are truly heroes. And those in the essential services are, are stepping out in courageous and heroic ways. But maybe that's not the whole story uh, if we look at their lives. Maybe that's not the whole story. Maybe that actually obscures the reality about their real human lives. Uh, we do this with, uh, in history and in popular culture and mythology. We have actually in America quite a few people that are, are seen this way. I watched the Alamo a couple of weeks ago and uh, Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier is in there. He's this mythical figure who wrestled bears and forded rivers and did all kinds of amazing things. And we're quite attracted to that kind of heroic character. My own country, uh, there's a man by the name of William Wallace, who you may have heard of, uh, who was a, a great champion, a warrior for Scotland. Uh, I know you're thinking, that's not William Wallace. So, okay, here you go. Here's the real William Wallace. Okay, happy now? Blue face, Mel Gibson, that's the real man, right? But it, amongst all the hero is heroism, it seems that often in these stories that we tell, we don't get to see the real person with all the messy parts, the mistakes, uh, the moments of heartbreak and even moral failure. We kind of set them up. We kind of want them to be these heroes. Uh, but actually, perhaps it's not that helpful to us uh, as a model for life or somewhere to turn. We find ourselves actually encountering the mess of life ourselves. 
Uh, and our culture currently is, is full of these somewhat false one-dimensional perspectives of what it means to be a person. And, and social media, I, I, I think you know, is, is a prime candidate for this kind of thing where people generally only ever post the good things about their lives. And they can lead us to really believe we're the only person out there who's struggling or who's having a terrible day. My wife joked, actually, she's going to start an Instagram account and only show the really bad parts of life. Um, I'd like to watch that, I think. (laughs) Hopefully I wouldn't feature too uh, heavily in it. But we don't really do that. We want to show that that things are good and and things are are wonderful. We We present that. But the thing is, when we find ourselves in times of trouble, confusion, pain, or just any form of disorientation, and when what we most need is empathy and a sense that we are not alone in this experience, we need to see examples of genuine and truthful human living to know that we're not alone. And sometimes the, the hero is not the place that we can turn for that. You know, what's so wonderful about this book that we call the Bible is that it gives us this sort of perspective. It doesn't sanitize things. It doesn't clean things up. It gives truthful perspectives on what it means to be a human being. All the things are there. All the sweat and the blood and the, and the struggle and the failure. It's just laid out for us to view and to witness. But what is wonderful beyond that, because that's not all it is. It's a collection of documents also full of humanity, but also it always is a given that God exists and that God is in relationship with his creation and especially with the people that he has made. And not only that, but he is a certain kind of God. That's what we see. And that's why this is so valuable to get a glimpse of people's lives lived out as human beings, but in in conjunction and uh, collaboration with this God. And Elijah is no exception. You know, Elijah may be a hero and he has been hailed often as that kind of hero. But what is so beautiful is we get a glimpse of the real man and perhaps no more other place in the whole of scripture do we get such an honest um, picture and representation and story of a man in disorientation. He's at the pinnacle of his career in chapter 18 at great risk to his own life, he's gone to confront the king and he has said, you king of Israel have broken faith with the God of our fathers and you've abandoned his ways and you are following these pagan practices of what was called Baal, which was the God that the other nations would worship. And he's encouraging the people of Israel to do the same. And, and, and the prophet Elijah, he comes and confronts him. And it ends up being kind of a competition, like some kind of uh, super Olympics Uh, with these 450 prophets of Baal, the false god, and they meet on this mountain, on Mount Carmel. And basically, the prophets of Baal are given an opportunity to, they set out a sacrifice and they dance and they cut themselves and do all of their rituals to call down some form of evidence that their god is real, that their god is there. And there's utter silence, nothing happens. Then Elijah stands alone and he walks forward to the altar that he has created and he says, God, let it be known that you are the true God and turn the people's hearts back to you. And this fire immediately comes from heaven and consumes the altar and even the stones and the earth in which it stood, this powerful demonstration that yes, God is here in answer to this man's cry. That's a Big, heavy responsibility on one person's shoulders. But he, then he calls the people to worship and they fall on their faces and they declare, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And it's a wonderful ending to, a, to an amazing story and the prophets are defeated. Then Elijah, not only does that, but he then says, let it rain. And the rain returns to give fertility and fruitfulness to the land again. And what a, what a pitch, what a moment, what a moment of triumph for Elijah. But the next thing that happens is, is quite strange. Because after this tremendous victory, word comes to Elijah that the king's wife, whose name is Jezebel, is very, very angry at him. And she has vowed to kill Elijah. And so in this scripture in 1 Kings, we're going to join Elijah at the moment and immediately after when he receives this news. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 through 18. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. 
When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread, baked over hot coals, and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So we meet this man, Elijah, at a, such a low point in his life. And it's one I think that many of us can identify with. I know, I, I do. I identify with this. And he's almost unrecognizable as the hero whom we have encountered up to this point. But what is so wonderful is we also get to see how God meets him there and, and possibly open up ourselves to the truth of that kind of encounter for ourselves when we find ourselves in a similar place. Elijah is in the midst of a deep and heavy disorientation. And it's reflected clearly in the text in several ways. Firstly, it's reflected in his actions. Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Ever had the experience? I remember being chased by a whole... Uh, beehive, which I inadvertently wandered into in the woods. Uh, and my response, I didn't think twice about it. I'm running. Luckily, they were not the Asian, uh, you know, uh, killer hornet things that have been apparently appearing in our, in our land. But just regular bees were enough to make me run. But do you know that feeling? You know that feeling where whatever the circumstances, you just got to get away. You're not thinking about the what or the where, just whatever it is you're trying to distance, distance yourself from, and you just want to get out of there. He is afraid and he runs for his life. Then it says, he sat down and he prayed. He is at a place clearly where his own abilities to cope are, are, are not sufficient. He runs away and now this desperate place, he sends a desperate call to God, 
And we're going to hear just how desperate that prayer is in a moment. The next thing he does, his actions show his disorientation. that He lays down and falls asleep. He's not just exhausted physically, but also emotionally. He just wants to shut the world out, stop his thoughts, and escape to the warm refuge of blissfully unaware slumber. You know, a major symptom of depression is a lack of a desire to get out of bed. I mean, maybe you've experienced that. I know I have at times. The feeling that there's nothing really worth getting up for. There's, there's nothing I can do. In fact, what awaits me in the day is too overwhelming to face. Just pull up the covers, close the curtains, close the eyelids and escape to the peace of sleep. And this is Elijah. He just wants to sleep. He's done. It's also reflected in the prayer that he, he brings. He prays, but it's a prayer of despair. Kind of echoing perhaps some of the Psalms uh, that we talked about in the very first uh, in this sermon series of Psalms of Disorientation. It's clear from what he says that he is not in a good place. First thing he says, I've had enough, Lord. I've had enough. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, he is beat. He's done. This is a death threat. After all the crazy competition and the, the danger of his situation that he has overcome, this is one woman's word toward him, and it, it has just done it for him. He's apparently found the limits of his human strength. You know, if I had a dollar for every time over the past few weeks, someone has said to me, okay, I've had enough of this, I would have about $49. But I've heard it a lot. Had enough. We say that disorientation is a place where we say, I've, I've had enough. It's by its very nature, an encounter with something that doesn't fit the normal pattern of life. And we don't currently have the abilities, the tools, the intellect, or the energy to cope with it. And, and our response is, done, had enough. Second thing he says is this. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm a failure. Hey, they named me the special name, and, and my, I don't know who his ancestors were. Well, it doesn't tell us who they are, but obviously he looks back and sees their success, their steadfastness, their strength, and he feels like a failure. Wow, I've really blown it. I have not lived up to the expectations of my family or my name. You know, just an aside, I just want to say it's important. This is important. If, you, if you're a parent... I'd say just please try and avoid presenting your, your kids with the sense that you're perfect, <laughs> that you've always lived a perfect life and you always have been, you always will be because it's going to lead to some serious senses of inadequacy and failure for your kids. I wonder if, wonder if Elijah saw his ancestors in that way and, but clearly he's disoriented. I, I'm a failure and I've had enough. So the next thing he says is just the, kind of the pinnacle of this disorientation. He says, take my life. Take my life. And it's not in the sense of the old hymn, you know, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. He means take my life, end it. I don't see a way forward at the moment. You know, I don't think anyone's immune to some element of that experience. And the scripture is actually full of it. The honesty of scripture tells us about Rebecca and Solomon and Jonah and even Paul the Apostle had these moments where, where they felt that this was perhaps just the thing that would be best. When there seems no viable way forward in life, it's a place of complete loss of hope. But just listen actually to the words that he says. There's something uh, that is common to all these phrases and it's really I. I've had enough. I'm no better than my ancestors. Take my life. His whole existence has been narrowed down to simply his own self. But the thing is, God is with him. God is with him. His current state of disorientation is also reflected in his location. The, the, the way this is written, it tells us where he is, and is, that is full of meaning. As we've discovered already in, in the previous messages, firstly, he's in the wilderness. He goes to the wilderness. He runs away and travels into the place, the barren land. He says he goes to Beersheba, where he leaves his servant. I think it's interesting that he has wits enough about him to take care of the well-being of that man. He doesn't take him with him out into the wilderness, but perhaps also being isolated is part of the, the things he is encountering right now. 
But it's, it's interesting. Sometimes we're very good at taking care of the needs of others, even when our own lives are crumbling. Um, but then he heads off by himself into the wilderness in order to escape from his would-be assassin. Elijah has headed out into the wilderness. It's a place where he will encounter a lack of all that might be typically depended upon for sustenance, of food, of water. It's a barren place. It's an empty place. It is devoid of other human contact. But, but the thing is, perhaps this is exactly the place where he will meet God. Perhaps. And I think that's, Scripture tells us about the wilderness. Many times when this concept appears, it's a place where there's an encounter, though painful, uh, but there's an encounter with God. A writer in a dictionary I was reading about this passage uh, writes that the wilderness represents an obstacle to salvation or being saved or, or, or living that can only be overcome with divine help so that it is there that some of God's mightiest acts of salvation may be perceived. He's in the wilderness, but, but God, is, God is there. God is there. Secondly, he ends up in a cave so the wilderness, he goes there first and he ends up in a cave. What is a cave all about? If you've seen Lord of the Rings, um, one of my favorite parts of that old film, that's very old now, it's crazy. Um, but Gollum, who is originally this kind of river-dwelling hobbit-like person, but he encounters this ring which starts to kind of suck all of his life force out. And there's this really sad thing where he, he just kind of crawls off into a cave at the foot of the mountains and he says, I forgot the taste of food and I forgot the feeling of the sun. I mean, a cave is not a pleasant place to be. David uh, hid uh, regularly in caves, King David of Israel. And, and really, what, what is a cave? Really, a cave is both about protection and, and narrowing down one's world to the smallest possible dimensions. It's dark and, and it's... You are surrounded by rock walls and it feels like it offers a place just to hide into the darkness and the enclosing arms of solid rock. I mentioned this to my wife, Rona, the other day. Actually, I was talking about the whole concept of a cave and she said, you know, it's like just curling up into the fetal position. Like that's the image. I don't know if you've encountered that feeling over the past couple of months or so. I know I have where I just want to minimize myself to the smallest possible space. What a desperate situation this man is in. But what is so wonderful is that these places of disorientation and seclusion are apparently strongly inhabited by the God who knows Elijah, who loves Elijah, who saw Elijah and still seeks Elijah. Um, David, who I mentioned a, a second ago, King David, and it was well acquainted with these same emotions and these places of disorientation and also spent his own time, as I said, hiding in caves in fear. And he wrote these amazing words. In Psalm 139, he said this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And so in the very midst of Elijah's crisis, God is there. God is there. Elijah could never run so far or so fast as to run out of the world where, that God inhabits or out of the presence of God. And that is good news, both for Elijah and for us. There's two reasons textually that we know that God is there also to make it absolutely clear the way this is written. Two reasons. Before any actual encounter with God, we, we get this kind of sense of promise that God is here. The first is that it says that uh, Elijah uh, gets up, strengthened by food. He travels until he reaches Horeb, the mountain of God. It's like a place where God is, is expected to be. So Elijah travels there. It's specifically called the mountain of God. It's also Mount Sinai, most people believe. And it's a really famous place in the Bible for God to show up. 
It's where Moses first heard from God from within the burning bush. And then many years later, when Moses came back, it's the place where he received the Ten Commandments and, and had his own experience with God. Um, in fact, it's interesting that the experience that, that Elijah is about to have really mirrors an experience that Moses himself had on the same mountain. So Elijah may run, but he runs in the right direction. He runs out to the wilderness. He runs from wilderness to a cave, but he runs to a cave on a mountain where he might have expected to encounter God. And God is indeed there, and he makes it clear. The second reason in the text that we know that God is there is the question that God twice asks Elijah. And he says this, what are you doing here, Elijah? And if you think about it, God could easily have said, what are you doing there, Elijah? What are you doing over there, Elijah? But he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? The fact that God says here implies togetherness. God and Elijah are in the same place. And God meets him. And how does that happen? There's four ways that God meets this servant, this broken, disoriented, depressed, sad, hopeless servant of the Lord. The first thing is just amazing. It, the first thing is that God brings a practical and personal ministry. It seems like the simplest thing. You would expect God to do something more, but it simply starts with bread and water. Bread and water. And not just any bread. The text says bread that has been baked over hot coals. And imagine being in that, that, that cave, that dank, slimy, water-drippy place. And this amazing smell of baking bread starts to fill Elijah's nostrils. It's not like life giving. So, first things first, God determines first thing this, this broken, sad, lonely, depressed, beaten man needs is food. And so, an Uber Eats angel is sent to deliver some food for him. What a wonderful thing that is. That tells us that God cares about the seemingly small details. It tells of his infinite, intimate familiarity and concern for our basic, most basic of needs. It's actually echoed when Jesus is resurrected and it says at one point that his, some of his disciples are fishing on the Sea of Galilee and they spot Jesus on the shore. And what is he doing? He's made a little charcoal fire and he's cooking some fish to feed them when they come and join him on the shore. That's the kind of God that I want to be in relationship with, the one that cares about these small provisions of nourishment. And it's an angel. So an angel. Some have said this is kind of a, a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus. Others say it's just a simple kind of a concept of an angel, someone who is both a messenger of God and one who carries out his will. You know, it got me thinking about the concept of, of being a servant of God and food. And it really fits well with our food pantry. I thought, you know, if angels are those who, who serve God and do his will and provide for the basic nourishment of such a man as Elijah in a time of disorientation, what a wonderful illustration of what it is that we're doing a new song when we bring food. We're God's messengers. We're God's servants. And, and in a place of disorientation, some of the best things you can do is just feed somebody. So here's the thing though, Elijah's disorientation is much deeper than what can be fixed by some angel cake food and a glass of Perrier water or whatever. It's deep, he needs more. Second thing God does, first is a practical and personal ministry, the second thing God does is a fresh encounter. It's like, kind of like the manna, the children of Israel had this manna that fell down. It was, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And he compared himself to this miraculous provision of, of food called manna for the people of Israel in their wanderings in the wilderness. But it only kept for one day. If you tried to keep it to the next day, it would spoil. It was fresh every day. And this is what Elijah needs. He needs a fresh encounter uh, with God. And this is what he receives. And it's really a strange passage that this great and powerful wind tears the mountain. How scary is that being in a cave in the midst of that kind of a storm? And it shatters the rocks. And then there's an earthquake. And then there's a fire. And it sounds a bit like Southern California, doesn't it? But what it says is God is not in those experiences. It clearly says after everyone, God was not in the wind. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire. But then it says this. It says, and there came a gentle 
whisper. And the repetition of God was not in the ends. It stops with the implication that God was on the mountain, in the cave, in the stillness, with a gentle voice to Elijah. You know, it's no coincidence that the false god Baal, who has been such a trouble for Elijah, was actually known as a god of wind and storms, of cataclysm and chaos. Um, there are actually many similarities uh, between Yahweh and Baal. I'm sure the God of Israel was utterly powerful, creator of all things, and the one who could bring dreadful power upon the earth in judgment and wrath. In fact, the demonstration on the previous mountain when Elijah had this competition with these other prophets, and the fire came from heaven. It was a tremendous show of power. Uh, but that was, uh, Baal was known to be that, but actually he was nothing inconsequential. He didn't do anything. But the, and the main difference is that this God of incredible power who Elijah meets is also true and real and present and attentive, relational, and intimate with his people, tender and protective. That's an amazing combination of power. But for Elijah right now, what he needed was just an intimate, fresh, Revelation. I wonder what that whisper said to Elijah. I wonder what God said to him on that, in that cave on that mountain. You know, it's incredible just a sense of, of God's power. Uh, always with God's tenderness. It makes me think of like a mother tiger. They're some of the most powerful carnivores on the planet. But when you see a tiger with its young and how it uses this mouth of destruction of saber tooth killing machine thing to carry its little cubs around. It is absolutely amazing, that combination of strength and gentleness. And by the way, no, I have not watched the Tiger King show. Um, I'm holding out. Elijah competed with the prophets of Baal for the hearts of the people. And it was amazing. The impotence of this pagan God was answered with the mighty fire of God from heaven. Yet in this moment of fear and desperation, what did Elijah need? He didn't need fire, or earthquake, or flood, or power. He needed a personal, gentle reassurance that he was okay, that he was known, and that he still had a purpose and a hope and a future, that he was not going to be cast away as a failure or rebuked as a weakling, a loser, a chicken, he was going to receive grace just as he was, just as he felt. And so God gives him the next thing. And it is a greater perspective. God asks twice of Elijah, why are you here on this mountain? And interestingly enough, if you look at the text, Elijah replies twice the very same way. He says the same response, identical. The Hebrew words are identical. I actually looked them up and all the squiggles and the dots in the Hebrew are identical in exactly the same places. It's the same response from Elijah. Even after he has this revelation, this fresh uh, connection with God, he still says the same thing. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. It's interesting he doesn't say, for you, <laughs> It's almost like an abstract. For the Lord God Almighty, the Israelites, and then he says, has rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Now, when we notice repetition in scripture, we've got to ask ourselves, why is it there? Why, what's the purpose? That he says, in answer to God's question, the same words twice. What is this telling us about Elijah? Well, I think it's telling us that he has a well-rehearsed sob story of his life and his reality at this point, a way of understanding the world and his place in it, and that his perspective has become bitter and self-obsessed and as dark, restrictive, and narrowed down as the cave in which he sits. Remember, Elijah has traveled 40 days and 40 nights to get to this place. 
you know, have you ever gone running or anything? I used to, I don't do it anymore. But any kind of repetitive thing is like running. You start to have songs. Sometimes they're really annoying songs and they just come in your head over and over again. I can imagine as Elijah was running to the mountain of God for 40 days and 40 nights, his repetition was like, I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I've been abandoned. No one is with me. I'm a failure. I am done. And he has rehearsed this to the point where he gets to the mountain. God asks him, why are you here? And he trots out his answer. And this is perspective on life. So what God has to do is break him out of this rut of self-focused thinking that has been fretted over until it has become firmly entrenched as reality. And God explodes it completely by what he says. Takes Elijah's small, narrowed down, shrunken perspective and blows it up. First Kings 19, toward the end he says, God says, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Hey Elijah, I reserve for myself, besides you, 7,000 followers. It reminds me of actually Elisha, who was the prophet that came after Elijah. And there's a time when, when uh, the city was besieged by all these enemies and there's, a, there's a, a man standing beside Elisha and he says, you know, basically, what are we gonna do? We are surrounded. And Elisha says, God, show him, open his eyes to see. And this other servant looks and sees the assembled hosts of heaven and the armies of heaven surrounding their enemies. God wants him to have a, greater perspective, to break him out of his thinking. Fourthly, what God does is give him a renewed purpose. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go back and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet, Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Go back home the way you came. Go back. But Elijah's not going back the way that he came. Something significant has changed. As he came in his place of disorientation, he has encountered a reorientation that came from this encounter with God. He is armed now with physical refreshment and energy, the encouragement of a personal and intimate encounter with the God who sees him, knows him, loves him, sends him, equips him. He has a brand new perspective and confidence and courage and purpose. And he has a deep trust that what God promises will come to pass. And he leaves that mountain a renewed person and he would not have become that person had he not entered into that disorientation so how can we apply this how might this help us with our own lives you know scripture has a purpose it says in the old testament that the word will go out and it will not return without having done its work how can this impact our lives well the first thing this tells us is about self-care just the fact that of this simple bringing of food, I think many of us could do with some more sleep, some more exercise, and some good food. You know, God cares about our bodies. And he's made us in such a way that we are holistic beings. Our, uh, all the aspects of who we are, our mind and our body and our spirit, they are connected. They are connected. And the fact that Jesus came in the flesh, or as my friend Sean says, God in a bod, it forever redeems the human body and is so important to take care of ourselves. Remember that God cares about those small details and it will bring refreshment to us. Perhaps you just need to have some good food, to take a look at your schedule, get to bed earlier, get up earlier. It can be powerfully effective when we are in a place of disorientation. But sometimes it seems so unspiritual to think that way, but it's so important. The second thing is honest prayer. If there's one thing that we, I think we've learned about this concept of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation that I hope will be become clear to us is that we need not and actually must not hide our true feelings from God. You know, Elijah just poured it out. And we too 
must do that. Find that place of his authenticity to come to God and tell him how you really feel. Even if it's ugly, actually, especially if it's ugly, then he will meet the true you. He already knows where you're at and you will encounter that uh, relationship and that change in, in the midst of who you really are, not who you're pretending to be. You know, we've encountered some words over the past weeks, which I think have been useful. For example, the wilderness. And then for Melody, talked about the corridor or the hallway and now the cave. I think these are amazing and imaginative ways of understanding our own situation and perspective. Uh, but to remember, as we consider those, am I in the wilderness right now? Do I feel like I'm, I'm out of, of the place of sustenance or ability to cope? Or am I in that corridor hallway? Am I moving through to something that is scary for me? Or am I in the cave? Have I narrowed down my life out of a sense of self-protection? Uh, and the wonderful thing is that all those places, that's where God is. That's where he meets us. So be honest with him in prayer. Thirdly, check your narrative. Check your narrative. What stories are you telling about yourself in, and God and this world in these days? Let God explode your narrative. Let him change it. Uh, like Elijah, we're prone to rehearsing our stories over and over again in negative ways and they lead us to become stuck in our thinking and, and somewhat resigned to things that we were never meant to be resigned to. Jesus calls us to a joyful, abundant way of living and his presence and his word are the fuel to make that real in our lives. You know, last week, Melody listed some amazing truths about God. And, and it really affected me. Sometimes in preaching, you know, the best part is just simply reading the Word of God. An old preacher said to me, you know, if you do one thing, Grant, read the Word. And, you, and you're on solid ground there. So we prepared a sheet that lists those scriptures and others. Uh, and I want us to take the time. I mean, immediately after this, this thing's over, whenever you're watching this, Print that out or bring it up on your screen and just take your time and read through these incredible promises of God and also these incredible proclamations about what God says about you. And I think it's a way that God might renew our thinking and break us free from our well-rehearsed, broken stories about our lives or about our world. And lastly, as with Elijah, embrace your purpose. I was talking with Josh the other day in passing, six feet apart wearing masks, of course, right? But talking about purpose, and he was talking about his message and how he, he was thinking that he wanted to kind of include that sense. And that actually purpose was one of the most important things for a healthy human being that we can ever have. Um, and what is our purpose? I mean, think about it in terms of uh, loving God and loving others. And glory, glory to God first. Uh, the, the sheets that we have... Uh, to work through for this series are really helpful in that, I think, to, to look, what, is, what has my purpose been? How has that been upset? Don't shy away from it. Take time, pray through it. How has my life been changed? And God, what new thing, as in Elijah, he was sent from the mountain with a renewed sense of purpose because he had encountered God in that place. And actually, he encountered him because he had nowhere else to go. Work through what is disorienting and then think about how your purpose might be renewed, how you might be equipped for what is next. You know, really the goal for our lives, I've been thinking of it in these terms, it is to build spiritual muscle memory. I think the fact that it's instructed that Elijah, in the midst of a terrible situation, instinctively not only prayed, but uh, sent himself out in a direction to a place where he expected God might be. And, and that came seem, seemingly second nature to him. And this is our goal. This is what we want to uh, become. We want to become people for whom our first response to the disorientation of our life is to go to God. Not because we want him to fix it, but because we actually have learned that that's where he'll meet us. That's where he'll meet us. And that's where we'll find renewal. That's where we'll find our lives changed. That's where we will be matured and grow to be more like him. And that is our goal. And just as God was faithful to meet Elijah in that place, I promise you that God will be faithful to meet you. And that is a rock solid promise. Thank you.
What a great time of worship this has been. I'm so grateful to Pastor Grant for bringing um, such good teaching. And um, I'm also just touched by our time of corporate prayer. You know, prayer is so important to everything that we do here at New Song. And uh, it is the way that we make our requests known to God. And then he has promised us that he will hear and respond. And uh, so I just uh, feel that that's such a, a valuable time. Uh, you know, we can also pray for each other. We have on our website a digital prayer wall. This is a place where people within our community are making their requests known uh, so that other people can be praying for them. So I would encourage you to go look at that, lift up uh, the uh, prayer request that you see there. And if you have a prayer request of your own that you'd like to post there, please uh, feel free to do so. If you feel a need for uh, just connecting with a pastor here at New Song, we also on our website have some sign-up places for uh, connecting with a pastor for pastoral care. Um, I would really encourage you to do that as well. Uh, maybe you're struggling through this time. Maybe you're facing some depression or whatever it may be. That pastoral uh, care time could be just exactly what you need. I'd like to encourage you to join us again next week. Uh, maybe even invite some friends. You know, uh, it's fairly easy to, you know, tell them how to tune in. So uh, maybe invite some friends and uh, we would look forward to just uh, worshiping with you again next week. And now as we go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you and may he make his face to shine upon you. God bless. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.